Is the new Camry too strong? Plus, what else do we see on Sunday in Phoenix? NASCAR might have a slight problem on their hand. The new Camry, it's strong, like really strong. Toyota went out and led 298 of the 312 laps on Sunday, and Christopher Bell sailed off into victory. Now, honestly, it's just going to get stronger, and it's going to continue to build and build and build, and we've seen this storyline before. You know, you're eventually going to end up as strong as, like, Gozer, and you're going to have to call the boys and have them roll up in the Ecto-1. But thankfully, we haven't seen Zul or Jens hanging outside the garage area, so we might be fine for now. But that new Camry is incredibly strong. I can't stress enough just how dominant that car was on Sunday. Before the strategy flipped them a little around halfway through that race, they were one, two, three, four, and everybody else was fighting for fifth. Unfortunately, they seemed to fire off very good where I was watching the lap times and the Chevys of Chase Elliott and William Byron were running comparable lap times to what we saw uh, from, you know, Denny Hamlin, Tyler Reddick, Chris Rebell in that range. Unfortunately, they didn't have the short run speed to kind of get that gap. And then everything kind of leveled out. And basically the top five, top six were running the same lap times, which isn't ideal because nobody's gaining or losing on each other. They're all just kind of running around in this parade separated by, you know, three quarters of a second or so in between each position. It wasn't very great racing at the beginning. And once that strategy did flip, we saw some other people move up, but ultimately those cars that got mired back in traffic just kind of hung out there. And now if you were Chris Rebell, you had a great car. You could just hack your way through the field like you were Lizzie Borden, which was great for him, but unfortunate for everybody else because they couldn't do the same thing. And hats off to them. When a team absolutely nails a setup, that's great. I you'd have no fault in that. Just tip your cap to them and hope that you can finish second. We've seen it happen before in the next-gen era. Kyle Larson seems to do it from time to time. And every now and then you'll see someone else do it. But for the most part, in the Gen 7 era, things have been pretty level. So for a team to hit it like this, again, hats off. Unfortunately, it's only the fourth race of the year. This is the fourth race for this new Toyota body, fifth race if you count the Clash, and everybody else is going to be playing catch-up. Why? Because if it's only race four, they haven't truly dialed in this car yet. So they're only going to get stronger. And now, I'm not one of those people that's definitely in the Facebook comments right now being like, NASCAR loves Toyota, those cheating Yoders, you made them too strong, this and that. I understand how the sport works. Everything moves in an ebb and flow. Toyotas will be really strong, and then other teams will gain on them. Toyota will lose some, and everything seems to find its level. Water always finds its level, right? For the most part, the Cup Series always seems to find its level. And now Chevy started off the season winning the first three races, so it's not like they're out to lunch. But I will say, last weekend in Las Vegas, we saw Tyler Reddick run a very close second to Kyle Larson. That was only the first race on an intermediate track for this new Toyota body. Once they kind of get that dialed in, they should be just as good. I mean, Toyotas were great on mile and a half last year. And Kyle Larson of the Spring Las Vegas race seems to be money for whatever reason. So for now, everybody else can rest assured that Toyota's not at their full potential yet, but they also have to be a little bit concerned that they will be getting to their full potential maybe through those summer months. And now, like last year, we saw RFK and Chris Buescher hit it really strong for like five weeks there in the summertime, and then they kind of faded off towards the end of the year. That could happen here, but obviously Toyota is very strong. TRD not really wants to ever come out and talk about how good they think they're going to be, and they were talking about how good they thought they were going to be with this new car, and that's scary for everybody else involved. Now, like I said, I'm not willing to hop on and jump to conclusions yet. I think things are going to be fine. But those cars, like I said, look very strong. And if we were going to the championship race next week, you would just bet the mortgage on a Camry winning that championship race. Because right now, if they get to Phoenix, it looks like it's going to be lights out. Kind of the same way where like the last two years, we talked about if the Fords, whether that be Logano or Blaney, got to the championship race, you're like, well, they're going to be very strong. And that's exactly what we saw the last two years. And right now, leaving this race, we look at this and we're like, oh, they could be really strong. And granted, William Byron won this race last year. He didn't win the championship when we got back to Phoenix in the fall. And that could very well be the case once again. But right now, in this moment, that Camry is incredibly strong. And I think GM's going to be scrambling to figure out what they need to replace the Camaro with over the summer, whether that's an actual Chevy product, whether they bring over the Blackwing platform, the CT4, CT5 from Cadillac, rebadge it as a Chevy and sell it as the SS or whatever they want to do, or they do a complete brand switch from Chevy to Cadillac. They desperately will want to make some sort of change because they want to catch up to what Toyota has and what Ford has. Right now, we know that the Chevy body has the most down force. 
Whatever the Toyota has done in terms of finding downforce while reducing drag seems to be the best of the three at the moment. Again, we have to wait and see how the rest of the season plays out before we jump to conclusions, but looks very strong. What else did we see at Phoenix? Not much. Ty Gibbs ran up front for a lot of the day. Todd Gillen was the only other person to lead laps on Sunday that was not a Toyota, and that just happened during his uh, during pit strategy, during the pit cycle. So hats off to him, I suppose. For everyone else, though, just kind of a lackluster race. The race did have around 2,800 green flag passes, 2,813. I saw NASCAR's resident PR hype man, Josh Hamilton, on Twitter Sunday night talking about how this was an improvement over you know previous races. And it was, right? In the Gen 7 era, this had the most green flag passes. But green flag passes can be skewed to fit the narrative that you want. I mean, numbers never lie, except for when you kind of skew them to fit. So it had about 300 more green flag passes than the spring race last year. This race had one additional caution. And green flag passes, you also have to take into account green flag pit stops, as well as how many restarts there are. He also mentioned that there were 19 green flag passes for the lead. Again, green flag pit stops do affect that immensely. So it's all up in the air. Was what we saw on Sunday marginally better? Yes, I would argue that. I gave this race a 60 in my Was It a Good Race on TikTok. And it's mid, right? I called it the Eric Amaral of races. It did nothing memorable, but it was very forgettable. It was just there. When we think about it, we'll be like, oh yeah, Christopher Bell won that race. And then you won't remember anything else from it. He had a dominating performance, which was great for him. Chris Buescher finished second. Ty Gibbs finished third. Brad Keselowski finished fourth. Ryan Blaney fifth. And now keep in mind, a lot of this strategy flipped about mid-race, and the guys that were running up towards the front, Chase Elliott and William Byron in particular, they got stuck back in 18th and 19th. And I saw Jeff Gluck be like, well, maybe their cars just weren't good enough to actually be 5th and 6th place, and once they got back in traffic, that was their true pace. You're not wrong, but I would argue that the package is broken if the guys that are 18th and 19th fastest, assuming because that's where they finished, if they're able to run 5th and 6th and no one else is able to pass them, that's a bad package. So... I think there's still tons of room for improvement on this. There's no silver bullet. 750 horsepower might help a little bit, maybe about as much as what we saw today helped over last year. But at the end of the day, they need a narrow tire, they need more horsepower, and they need to probably just take the underbody off of these cars. But again, a lot of it comes down to budgetary restraints and NASCAR not wanting to have these teams spend a ton of money on top of the money they're already spending uh, to just kind of take a swing at things. And I understand it. Unfortunately, it just kind of is what it is. Ross Chastain, last year's fall winner, he finished uh, sixth. Martin Truex Jr., seventh. Michael McDowell, eighth. Great run for him. Chase Briscoe, ninth. And Tyler Reddick, tenth. Tyler Reddick probably had the second fastest car uh, in this race. He was only able to make it back up to tenth after his pit stop. Denny Hamlin spun out. He was able to rebound for an 11th place finish. And Noah Gragson, top 12. He continues to impress over at Stuart Haas Racing. Outside of that, like I said, this race was very forgettable. Austin Dillon, once again, having a terrible race, but thankfully he had Morgan and Morgan on the hood because yes, he was involved in an accident, so he could call them. Um, and well, probably not get anything out of Derek Krause, who spun out and caused that incident. Austin Sendrick, abysmal day for him. Last place finish. Corey LaJoy, for the first time in 44 races, recorded a DNF. And outside of that, let me just take a look at the rest of this here. Not much else to really report home about. Kind of just a midday overall. Weird kind of how the strategy played out, but at least they weren't having to go around and save fuel all the time. As much as I do love a good fuel race, at least it wasn't like the Daytona 500 were running half throttle. I'm concerned for the fall when we get back, but for now, that's what I thought. Um, it was forgettable, but also enjoyable at the same time because race cars on track is never bad. So let me know in the comments. Did you enjoy this race? Did you not like this race? And what do you think about the new Camry? Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.